Hey everyone, just going to give everybody a minute to come on in to the webinar. Welcome everybody. Um, and if you can just take a moment while we're sort of welcoming everybody in to type your, um, your name into the chat and let us know where you are calling in from today so we can kind of get a sense of uh, who is here joining us for this session. So go ahead and open the chat, um, type in your name and tell us where you are coming from. I'm in the Boston area. It's always so nice to know where people are coming from. So, okay, they're coming in fast and furious now. Wow, we've got people from Canada, Arizona, Ohio, Dallas, uh, Minnesota. They're going really fast. Oh, someone from Australia, amazing. Canada, Texas, all over the place. So, so nice to see you all. A bunch of people from the UK, Virgin Islands, excellent. So it's great to have all of you here and we're gonna go ahead and get started. So welcome back to our Surface Design Symposium. In this session, we're going to be discussing how to stay motivated, create a workflow, and manage your time as an artist. Today's event is being co-presented by Spoonflower and Craft Industry Alliance. Spoonflower is a print-on-demand manufacturer that produces wallpaper, home decor, and fabric. Their online global marketplace connects makers and consumers with independent artists all over the world who earn royalties every time their designs are purchased. Any artist can set up a shop at spoonflower.com to start growing their surface design business. And I am Abby Glassenberg, the co-founder of Craft Industry Alliance. Craft Industry Alliance is an organization that helps you to build your business. We know that building a business is lonely and it's a lot of hard work. So Craft Industry Alliance is a community for craft professionals where you can get advice and support every single day. Build your network alongside other artists and makers Plus, you can get in-depth coverage of craft industry news and ideas, tools, and resources to help you make smart decisions. So you can check that out at craftindustryalliance.org. Now, we would love to learn a little bit more about each of you who is here joining us today. So we're going to launch a poll where you can let us know what you struggle with when it comes to time management. So look for that. And for the topic of today's panel, we all know that creativity ebbs and flows. Sometimes we're in the zone and other times it's so difficult to get started. During today's panel, you'll learn how four successful working artists and creatives stay productive. They're going to describe rituals they use to get their creative juices flowing and motivation techniques that help them see projects through to completion, even when they're feeling uninspired. So you'll learn creativity warm-ups to help you get started, how to organize your space for optimal productivity, time management techniques that really work, and how to break down large projects so that you can see them through all the way through. So um, before we dive into our panel, I thought it would be a good idea to learn more about each of our panelists with a short introduction from each of them. So if you don't mind starting, Terrence, we're gonna start with you. Hi, my name is Terrence Williams. I am a small business owner of my business, Terrence Williams Designs, where I make ethically sourced and sustainably produced clothing and accessories. Everything is genderless and size inclusive. I am also a content creator and influencer, and I work with makeup, skincare, lifestyle brands. Wonderful. Welcome, Terrence. Janetta, you're going to go next. Hi, my name is Janetta Gonzalez and I live in Los Angeles. I am an illustrator and a surface pattern designer and also an artist mentor. And I'm a Spoonflower ambassador. Welcome, Janetta. Uh, Kate, you're up next. Oh, Kate, you got to unmute. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, okay, so, okay, so I'm Kate Reese. I uh, am a surface pattern designer. I came to this a lot later in life. I used to be an accountant and um, I recently, well, it feels recent, 10 years ago, I decided I wanted to do this. Um, and so I learned, uh, I took classes online and started on Spoonflower and now I have my designs on lots of products all over the world. 
Wonderful. Welcome, Kate. And Thank finally, you. we have Danielle. Will you introduce yourself as well? Unmute. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Danielle Krissa. I write a blog, well, I guess it's no longer a blog, uh, called The Jealous Curator. Um, I've been doing that since 2009. I'm an artist myself, um, but because of creative blocks and inner critics, I quit for a very long time between art school and now, about a 20 year hiatus. Um, and once I started making again, I realized that everyone gets blocked and has inner critics. And so I wrote, I've written, um, my seventh book is about to come out in the spring. It's called Art and Joy. It's a children's book. Everyone go buy it. Pre-order now. Um, and so, yeah, it's all about everything I do um, in my own artwork and for other people is about figuring out how to get inspired, not letting an inner critic stop you um, and not if you are blocked, how to get unblocked. Okay, so I, what I did say while I was muted was that we have a real diversity of backgrounds, experience levels, um, experiences in general, and, um, and types of businesses as well. So I think this is going to be a fabulous discussion, and I would love to dive in with creative rituals, sort of the beginning, the way that you might start your day, start your creative session, whatever it might be doing. Can you describe a creative ritual that you have and why that particular ritual works for you. So we'll start with you, Janetta, on that one. Yes. Um, what I like to do is make sure my workspace is tidy and clear and clean. If I'm about to start a new project, um, I can't be distracted by all the other mess and things that are around here calling my name to work on or put away or whatever. So um, I definitely will, will clean first and um, get everything I need together and then I can start fresh. Okay, so cleaning up, that's important mm -hmm. for sure. Gathering, Gathering materials too. And what about you, Kate? Okay, so <laughs> my space is not tidy at all. Uh, I just wrote that down to start cleaning because I think that would make a big difference. Um, but for me, it's just um, sitting down and doing it. And a lot of times it's hard to get there, but it's just, I make myself sit down. I don't do emails and I start by just uh, making. And if I don't want to make anything, I pull up blocks of color. And whenever I pull up these blocks of color, I'm always like, okay, I, I'm inspired to make something this or that. I love the idea of not starting with emails because we all know that rabbit yeah. hole that when you sit down and begin, you can't get out and now it's lunchtime. So it's always, yeah. I think, a great idea to sort of say, nope, keep it closed. Um, keep that laptop closed is what I meant to say there. Um, so I'd love to talk a little bit about routine as well um, in developing that daily schedule. Um, and I thought that was really interesting that you said, Kate, like you just sit down and start making even if you don't feel like it. And that does sound like maybe you have a schedule in place where, you know, work starts at a certain time or, you know, after a certain task is over, like breakfast or whatever it might be that you um, then begin and that's your schedule. So Kate, could you start there and just share with us what your daily schedule looks like? Okay, so I get up, I get the kids off to school and I run to the gym and then I come back, I shower and I sit in my chair. Um, so it's just, I get all my wiggles out <laughs> and, um, free up my space. Cause I have to, I can't have anything else going on at the same time. So I shut my phone off. Um, and like I said, the emails and I just, I sit, uh, cause it is very easy to get distracted and it's hard if I don't. It's hard for me if I know I don't have very much time. So I wait until I've kind of freed everything up and I don't have anything to do, except for I know I have a lot of emails uh, that I have to cover, but I just, I ignore them until I've actually made something. Okay, so it's just starting right there. And I love the idea of muting your phone. I think that's a really good um, additional suggestion around not doing emails, sort of not, and just basically decre decreasing distractions. Um, Danielle, do you have specific uh, routine that you follow, you know, most days in order to make sure that you get your creative work done? 
Um, I do. It all starts with coffee. There needs to be fresh coffee. Um, and then for me, it's funny because I have to, then this might be a question later on, but I have a lot of different things that I do. So, you know, I'm either working on Dallas curator posts or I am writing books or I am working on my own artwork. So I have to kind of either splice up my day or decide what I'm doing. So whatever it is that I'm doing, um, just like Kate said, I just have to focus on that one thing and not let guilt about the other things come in. So if I'm writing a book, it's like, okay, well, I can't worry about being in the studio today because it's book day. So that's just what today is. And I'm not going to think about the other stuff. Um, when it's studio day, same thing. I turn off my phone. Um, I make fresh coffee. My studio is in my basement. So it's, it's a physical removal from the rest of my house. So I can't see the messy kitchen. I can't see anything else. And I go down there. I have a pair of studio shoes um, that I put on and it just feels like, okay, I'm going to work. I'm an artist now. I put on my studio shoes um, and I get started again. Like it might just be tidying um, if I'm not in the mood. I'm a collage artist. So sometimes if I'm not in the mood, but I've scheduled studio time, I just go and start cutting stuff out because one day I'll need those things cut out. And usually that leads to some kind of inspiration and something starts getting made. Right, just playing with the materials. I love the idea of studio shoes. This is a, this is a really good one <laughs> where you have something special that you put on um, that helps you know, you know, now you're at work. So that, that's a great tip. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about um, goal setting whether that's kind of longer term goals or, you know, shorter term goals. And if those help you to make progress, um, this is probably something that, you know, everyone could answer. Um, but, um, but we'll start with you, Terrence, if you have, do you have thoughts about goal setting or do you not set goals? Are you somebody who just kind of goes, you know, not for, goals don't work for everybody. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that one. So when it comes to my small business, the number one thing is getting orders out and getting them finished and processed. So that is the number one goal every morning. That is the main focus, uh, fulfilling orders and then shipping them out. On a bigger scale of looking at my small business, it's always about scaling. So where can I get my products, whether in store, where can I find different collaborations? What's the next collection going to be? You know, what are going to be the themes? Uh, I do a lot with sustainability. So how am I going to incorporate sustainability and human rights into my design? So looking at the bigger picture long term. But orders are number one. <laughs> right. And so you tackle, it sounds like you tackle number one, which are getting the orders out first in the day so that it doesn't end up being, you know, after the post office is closed and now you haven't, you know, gotten them done or whatever. Yeah. So prioritizing the most important thing and tackling that first is a great, that's a great tip. And Kate, do you have thoughts about um, short term or longer term goals and kind of how those help to keep you motivated and organized? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I have long term goals, but I've found that uh, just basically my short term goals, which is today is what has made all the difference. And so um, I try, I mean, you have to plan for where you wanna be, but I try not to think too hard about where that is because uh, it's really frustrating to wanna be further down the road. Um, so honestly, I just, I focus on today. I try to make something every single day and I make that my priority. And there are a lot of things that are a priority and especially all of you guys know that as a small business owner, there's social media you have to stay on top of and contacting people and uh, 17 different jobs that you have. And so I've put as my number one priority just to make something every single day. And that has been the biggest game changer for me just because um, most of the work I sell is my daily practice so right so in in similar to terrence which is to say like 
whatever the main goal is for the day, doing that first and making sure it gets done every single day. Um, so really setting priorities um, is hugely important. Um, I wondered if you have thoughts on that, um, that question of short-term and long-term goals. Janetta, do you have anything to add there that ways that you use goals to help keep you on track or keep you mo motivated? Oh, yes. Uh, goals is really important, um, I think, especially uh, when you're, you know, you, you have things that you really want to do and accomplish. And I, you know, if, if I get way off track, it's not going to happen. So it's important to, I think it's a great, it's great if you can make art every day. I personally can't, and I really admire that you can do that. <laughs> um, I, um, I, but what I do is I, I definitely make sure that I'm chipping away at whatever it is that I need to to get done and i you know i put it in my calendar and i make those put those tasks in the calendar so they are getting done when they need to get done and you know i kind of give them a little bit of wiggle room too because you know life happens right so um but as long as i'm chipping away at it i can see the progress and track it and make sure that i'm going to reach that goal yeah absolutely I'd love, I, I'd love to talk since you, since you referred to your calendar mm -hmm. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about apps that, um, that some of you might be using to, or other tools. You know, I have a lined pad of paper next to me and I use that rather than, you know, organizational apps. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but tools or apps that you use to keep yourself organized and set those priorities that um, we just talked about. So um, I'll go to you, Danielle. I don't know if you have specific ways specific tools that you're using, whether digital or physical, to keep yourself organized. I'm so glad that you said you use paper because I was like, I am about to age myself by saying um, <laughs> paper. <laughs> I need to, I'm one of those people, I really love lists and I love crossing things off of lists. So sometimes even after I've done something, I put it on the list just for the satisfaction of crossing <laughs> it off. Um, I often have a bunch of lists going uh, that I just tape to my studio wall or I write in here in my office. So for book related things, I have a list on the wall so that I see it all the time. Um, because I, otherwise I find that there's just too many things floating. So I need to be able to see it. The other thing is my husband is a gadget guy. So he always, you know, says, Oh, you could use this app or use this, or just put it in your notes on your phone. But then I find that I have a bazillion things in a whole bunch of different places. So for me, it is paper taped to the wall so I can see it. Very analog. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, but totally works and very approachable, right? Don't have to learn how to use anything new. Um, that's, yeah, that's great. What about you, Terrence? Do you have any ways that you're keeping track of things, uh, either digitally or physically? Yeah, I have so many apps that I love being a small business owner and having to manage social media, but also brand deals and everything. It can become a lot. So I love the app Asana. It's a digital app and you can create lists and it's nice because you can move them from like still working on, you know, partially done to completed. Um, so I like being able to physically move things and you can change different colors. For social media, I love the app later because I can plan and schedule my social media feed and I can see everything as it lays out and it also will auto publish. So I spend Sundays planning all of my social media content for the next two weeks and I'll just sit down all one day on Sunday and plan everything and then later we'll just push everything out automatically. And I lo also love the app Buffer um, but that also plans my social media posts also. And then I just have a bunch of apps for editing, um, adding music. Um, yeah, a bunch of a bunch of different things. I could talk about apps all day. That's great. <laughs> Such so many good recommendations there. Terrence, I just um, I just I wrote all of those down on my piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I would love to talk a little bit too about social media scheduling because, um, you know, Kate, I think as you mentioned, we all have so many hats and so many things that we need to get accomplished. And, um, and social media is definitely one of them where you need to do it, but it's a lot of work and it can fall um, off the list easily, but you really need to keep it going. So, um, Janetta, do you have um, apps or tools that you use to keep organized? 
Um, <clears throat> social media, actually, I have used later. I've used uh, Planet, uh, P-L-A-N-N-I-T, not P-L-A-N-E-T. Um, and uh, I've used a few a few of them. Um, I think they're all really great, actually. There is, they all have their own strengths. Um, so I would, lately, though, I have not been using any of those. I've just been kind of doing it on the fly and scheduling not even scheduling, just doing it on the fly. Um, but uh, but yeah, I highly recommend it. I recommend later or Planly or all of the above buffer. Um, also, but I like it for calendars. I'm an Asana user as well. Um, I when I found Asana, uh, my just world changed. <laughs> Let me tell you, like it. I know that we should we should be like getting paid for this language. <laughs> We're completely talking them up, but this is. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, there's, they're all real. I've tried a lot of them, and that one for me and how my brain works seemed to be the best solution. And I was a post-it person before, um, so post-it everywhere and notes everywhere and different notebooks and everything. I couldn't keep track of anything, and my ADD brain was like all over the place. So I just write it down in the moment and then forget where I put it. Right. So having one place where all my thoughts ideas, appointments, um, deadlines, everything lives in there. And again, you, like you said, you can move them around and they have list view, calendar view. Um, the different views is, that's what helps me see them things differently. So if I want to see it in a list form, I see a list form. The calendar form, I see in the calendar form. Um, and then I do still keep paper and that's where because I like to cross things off too. So that's if I have like my most important things for the day. Um, or I kind of plan out my day on paper and if, you know, I need to move things around, but I got everything locked down in the calendar, but if there, you know, some things are changing during the day, it's nice to like, just put that on paper and, you know, cross it off. So I do a little bit of both, but I definitely am I'm like a hardcore Asana user. I've been really like making my calendar tighter and tighter. So I know if I can take a new commitment or not, because I, before with the post-its, I wouldn't know, and, and I'd have some things in the calendar and some things I'd forget to put in the calendar, you know. So this way, it's, as soon as I get an appointment or make an appointment or get a deadline, it goes instantly in there. So I don't have to think about it, and it just frees up my mind so much. And, and then I can see everything at a glance and know, like, oh, okay, I have time for that, or, oh, I really don't have time for that, right? So it's been super helpful. Yeah, I love that idea of freeing up your mind, mm -hmm. like the mind space that's not taken up by like worrying about all of these other things. Mm -hmm. um, and also it's mobile. You can do it on your phone. So if you're if you have Asana or one of these other apps, there's other ones as well. But um, unlike your post-its and your notebook, if you're out, you know, somewhere and have an idea, you can or or somebody wants to schedule something, you can see it right there and add it right then. Um, so you don't lose it, you know, that idea which is helpful. Um, and I don't think Kate, that we got to you when it came to apps. Remind me if I'm wrong, because there's- No, I don't use that. I'm Post-it notes all the way, covered okay. everything Post-it notes. Got it. I think that's definitely relatable to a lot of people. <laughs> um, so I'd love to talk a lot about sort of um, rewarding yourself for accomplishing tasks because this can be something where you know especially if it's something that you really didn't want to do like pitching you know can sometimes be really painful um having to put yourself out there that way whether it's on the phone or email or bookkeeping or i don't know there's lots of maybe for you kid that's not a problem because you were an accountant but for a lot of us like bookkeeping can feel like a hard task um and things like that and, and so sometimes we can build in a reward to help us to get to get there. And so I, I'd love to talk a little bit about rewards. And Danielle, I don't know if you have thoughts about how you reward yourself for getting things done. Oh, this is a new thing for me because I am really bad about rewarding myself for anything. I always think that I will, or like if I've achieved a really big goal too, I, I, I'm like, I have to celebrate this or, you know what? And then I don't, I'm just on to the next thing. And then it's a blur of busyness. Um, but about a year ago, maybe it was, you know, lockdown time or something. I started thinking, okay, no, I have to like, you know, pat myself on the back sometimes. Um, and so my treat to self, <laughs> this is also where I get all of my inspiration. If I'm feeling kind of blah and not like making the thrift shop, I love 
the thrift shop. And so, um, and I am so busy that, and the best one is about 20 minutes away from me. So it's a little day trip to the um, thrift shop. So I just make a little, you know, hour or two out of it. And that's my treat for finishing something or doing something I didn't want to do or celebrating like, you know, a big, a big um, goal being achieved. I have, I, again, there's coffee involved. I go, I get a coffee. I go to my thrift shop, walk around, take it all in and usually buy something weird that I can bring back to the studio. And it just is like a nice, like satisfies all the things in me that I need. <laughs> it's so weird, but it's the truth. And what about you, Janetta? Do you have a specific um, rewards that you put in place for accomplishing things or celebrating? Um, sometimes. Yes. Um, if, there's something I really need to get done. Um, and there's a TV show that I really want to watch because I'm you know, <laughs> religiously watching it every week um, or, you know, binging it or whatever. I will stop the binge or I'll stop whatever and make sure I finish that work. And whenever that gets accomplished, I reward myself with the show, sit down on the couch and veg out and just, you know, escape. Um, I've also gone out for dinners i've gotten you know my favorite food uh if you know i accomplished uh i illustrated a children's book last year for uh, the first time i ever did that and um it was months and months of illustrating and just doing the same thing every day you know and uh there was no breaks for months and well little breaks but not much so at the end of that i definitely like had a my boyfriend and i went out and had this big big old fancy dinner and I was like I need to have a couple drinks and relax and like decompress from this and celebrate that this got done you know so things like that I'll, I'll find you know especially when they're like big big goals or big milestones um I will uh yeah definitely reward myself and and, and TV TV helps <laughs> makes it fun yeah, I love I love the idea of taking the time to celebrate because, you know, as you said earlier, Danielle, like it can be just like a flow of constant busyness if you don't take that moment to pause and acknowledge that, you know, an accomplishment has happened and success is taking place, you know. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, I mean, the problem with me, like, you know, having goals is great and wanting success is great. But I, what I what I talk about is the sort of this ladder of success <clears throat> and you have to like if your goal is way up at the top of the ladder, that's awesome. But you need to celebrate every rung, you know, and especially in a competitive where you're watching everyone on Instagram and it seems like everyone's at the top of their ladder and you're way down here. And if, if you're only celebrating when you get to the very top, it's going to be a long road. And so um, celebrating every little step that you make up your ladder is so important. So whether that is like for me, chips and dip and a good true crime, you know, that's celebrate that rung and really see what you have done. Um, the example I always give is I worked in advertising for years and I always wanted to get into this one magazine, uh, communication arts for years. That was the magazine I wanted to get my work into. And, um, one miraculous day it happened. And this piece that we had done for, it was for Mini, for BMW, um, we'd also submitted it to Cannes, to the Advertising Awards in Cannes. So I found out that it got into communication arts, this goal I had for years. And I was like, oh my God, I wonder if it'll get into Cannes. Like that's how long I celebrated this thing that I'd wanted for about eight years, for about three seconds before I was worried about the next goal. And then it did get into Cannes, but it got out bronze. And I went, woohoo, I wonder why I didn't get a gold. And I never celebrated either of those things. Then I was just on to, well, how can I get a golden can? Instead, you know what I mean? And so once I got out of advertising and all that stuff, I just thought, okay, wait, I need to celebrate every little thing. And whether that's from watching a TV show or going out for dinner or buying yourself the fanciest boots you've ever seen, whatever it is, you need to stop and celebrate those things and be proud of yourself. Sorry, I had to jump in and say yeah. that because that was such a big life change for me to realize that. Absolutely. I would love to talk a little bit about space. Um, we did mention this earlier around cleaning your space, but um, I wondered if you have some tips to share for making the most of your space 
even if you're working in like a shared area of your home, like, you know, the dining room table or something like that, not all of us have the benefit of having a separate studio, but just making use of the best use of the space that you have for productivity. So Terrence, we're going to start with you on that one. I have a very small tight space and it, it takes up uh, a lot of room because I not only do my sewing in my small business, but I also create my content and my videos. So I like to build up. So in the back, I have <laughs> these beautiful uh, uh, shelving units that I got from Amazon that I guess they're like industrial, but I have all my fabric, all my supplies, everything like that. Um, I try to use like crates and stuff, try to use as much wall space as I can. Um, so yeah, and everything, I have tables, everything is like under tables. It's organized chaos. Um, mm -hmm. I know where everything is and I know how everything is organized. It might be a little discerning for someone else, but yeah, I'm always about like building on top of everything. So I have floor, floor, floor space to move around and function and make, make my videos and TikToks and stuff. That's great. And making the use of a small space is really good advice. And what about you, Kate? Do you have thoughts on using your space optimally for productivity? I am really bad at that. Um, we had to move a house because uh, our relationship, my husband and I were not, he was not coping with me spreading out, but I do, I need to have like a space. And so I would get like big bins and um, I would spread everything out. And then when I had to put it all away, I'd stick it in a bin so that I could easily just spread it out again. Cause I do need to be able to see and feel and like have inspiration around. So, yeah. mm -hmm. but a mm -hmm. bin, a bin. Get a bin, especially if you have shared space, so you can put it away and quickly take it all back yeah. out and spread it out again. Yeah. Um, what about you, Janetta? Do you you have such a pretty space behind you? I don't know if you have thoughts on um, on you know maximizing your space. Oh, maybe Janetta's Janetta might you might have cut out for a second. We'll come back to you. Uh, don't worry, oh, yeah. um, okay. Danielle. Oh, there you are. Yeah, back. yeah. My okay. connection. I apologize. I don't know what's going on. It keeps jumping in and out. So you might see me disappear. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, can you repeat that again? Are you talking about space? Sorry, sure. My question was around maximizing your space. Oh, I was okay. saying you have such a pretty space behind you and how, how you organize it to, to um, have optimal productivity. Um, yes, I have the dining room and it is a high traffic area and it can be it can be hard sometimes because they're, you know, he's walking back and forth all <laughs> against snacks and I'm trying to go into the kitchen and I, you know, I'm sitting here like, ah, I gotta concentrate. So it can be, that can be hard. That can be hard. Um, so, and it's open, it's open to different rooms. So I, um, so I've had to kind of learn how to shut off the distractions and just focus on my table or my world um, and make it pretty. This is, this is, what I, you know, I, and it did not look like this a while ago. And I you know I put some paint on the walls and put up my pin boards and, and I've over time have worked on storage. Um, cause you know, it just gets out of control and it's like, okay, what do I have to do to make this more organized? So I've brought in like some Ikea cabinet tree and I have all the stuff going up high on the walls, like you do Terrence. So, um, I bought, um, I got some like wood from from Home Depot and some shelving brackets and I just made shelves going off the walls. Um, and so I keep my magazine files and my papers and all my art, other art supplies and stuff over there and things like in bins and I don't want any, I don't want to look at, you know, so everything is as organized as I can get it in here right now. But um, extra space, that's tough. Um, I have to constantly clean in a small space and organize and purge and or find new homes for things um like the garage or whatever if i you know i get a lot of samples of my work um uh, product samples so like right now i have three boxes in the floor and i have to sort through that and figure that out and i've been stepping over them for about two weeks now so it's time to, <laughs> to move those out of here um because it was starting to drive me crazy um but it's just like in the small space tidying up organizing tidying up organizing it again re 
okay, now I've accumulated this new stuff. Where does that go? Or do I need to create a new thing for that to live or space for that to live in? So it's, it's a lot of that <laughs> all the time. Um, you know, I wouldn't say all the time, but when new things or like new boxes come in. Um, so, and then I have zones. I have zones for everything. So I have a, two tables. One is my computer table and I do all my computer work there. And the other one is where I do everything else. So I paint, shoot my shoot videos right where I'm sitting here. Um, and that's another reason I set up the background the way I did so I can, you know, I have a nice background when I make videos um, or I'm on Zoom or something like that. So, and then it's, I can change it around. And this table is on wheels. It's one of those Ikea tables that has wheels. So I can rotate it if I need more light or if I want a different background. Um, and also just a different view, like, uh, you know, working and looking at the same view all the time, it can be kind of, all right, I want a change of scenery. And so this is kind of a way to trick my brain to like, feel like, oh, okay, I'm sitting and facing the window now, you know, and, and, um, or, and then I work that way for a little while. So I have a little bit of like flexibility in the middle of the room where I can move it around and change it up just a little bit. Uh, so that helps a lot. That's great. Such so many good pieces of advice there. I um, am motivated to <laughs> rearrange a little bit here. Um, so I would love to talk a little bit about connecting with other artists because at least for me, um, connecting with other artists really helps me to stay motivated. And I wonder how that works for each of you um, and how you build that into your schedule, you know, time to actually connect with other artists that you um, that you might know. So um, Kate, we'll start with you on that one. Okay, so um, I have found I have cut Facebook out just because it I found it to be a huge time waster. But meeting with other artists is what feeds my soul. And it is like the only way I found to keep going. So I've met artists along the way. Um, I don't have any that live near me. So um, I meet up at trade shows, Surtex, um, and just there's a few that I keep in touch with on Instagram. Um, but as far as like group chats or, well, I guess I'm talking like big group chats. I just don't do it because I found it's huge time suck and it also just doesn't do good things for my attitude. Um, so I've just found that a few friends that I keep in touch with uh, regularly makes a huge difference. So I try not to be friends with everybody on the internet, but having my few uh, artist friends has been a godsend. What about you, Danielle? Do you keep in touch with other artists um, and does that help you? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, when I started Jealous Curator, I was very, very alone. Um, I'd had a terrible experience in art school, which is why I quit making art. And I just thought all artists were mean and scary. Um, and, uh, and then once I started writing the Jealous Curator and these people would reach out and be like, oh, thanks for writing about me. It's like people these are the nicest people ever. Um, and so in the last 13 years, I've gotten this huge community of amazing like-minded people. Um, and in there, I've also made some really amazing friends. And sometimes it comes from doing a workshop. You know, if you've gone and done like a, a weekend intensive somewhere, like you super bond with those people and, um, and then stay close from there on in. I've also had, I've got really good friends who I have never met in real life. <laughs> They're, you know, I've met them on Instagram and we just DM. And I think it's really helpful. Um, you know, I always say creativity can't happen in a vacuum. You kind of need to let it out into the light. And you know, when you're working away on something, especially if you're working on something for a really long time, you get to that point where you're like, is this amazing or really stupid? Like, you know, you just you lose sight of what you're working on. And I just have a few really amazing creative friends that I will just DM on Instagram and be like, can you look at that? You know, I'll just send them a JPEG and be like, is this going in the right direction? Is this great? Is this not like, what do you think? And just to have these artists who are so amazing and generous to just bounce things around with, or, you know, it's, it's, it's invaluable. And I always say, you know, find your people. And that doesn't need to be a group of a hundred 
You know, it can be one, your people can be one person on the other side of the planet that you can reach out to every now and then when you need that, you know, if you got rejected from a show and you just want to vent or you got accepted to the show and you want to celebrate, like just to have those one or two people that you can reach out to is just invaluable. That's great. And I'd love to sort of tie that into sharing your work um, with the public on social media um, and whether you find that to be motivating or whether, you know, sharing, especially around works in progress, do you find that to be motivating to actually, you know, finish the project or do you kind of keep things under your vest, keep them private until they're totally completed and then kind of have this voila sort of moment and um, and sort of, yeah, just kind of posting on social media and whether that is helpful to you as far as motivation is concerned, and if so, how. So let's start with you for that one, Terrence. I'm very open and transparent about the things that I'm working on with my audience because it, they love to feel like they are part of the process. So not only will I show what I'm working on, but I'll also ask them for suggestions if they like different prints and patterns and things like that because not only are they viewing the process, but they're also buying the items. And so I want their input and I want their suggestions. And again, they love, us in the sewing community, we love to say behind the scenes, um, just to get another look. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into sewing and crafting a garment. So then you can see videos of us making every piece, cutting out all the patterns, seeing everything that it takes to make it, and then also see how I ship it and package it and all of that stuff. Uh, people really appreciate that more. So I love sharing and people love uh, love watching and giving the feedback. And what about you, Janetta? Do you share things as you go or only at the end? And do you find that to be motivating? Um, it depends on what I'm working on. Um, if I would say a good portion of some of the projects that I do, I have to kind of keep private. Um, some cases I can, most cases actually, you can kind of show the bits and bobs of it, right? So I will show like, oh, new project and kind of tease it. So I can show a piece of, you know, maybe the beginning stages or something and, you know, the process I'm working on or my supplies or, you know, things like that. Um, but, you know, when I was doing the children's book, I couldn't share any of that. Um, but if i'm just working on my own things absolutely I, I will absolutely show my process or or you know if it's even just a creative exercise i'm doing that day or i'm just you know painting for fun or whatever yeah I'll, absolutely and, I, and the feedback's always great um and it's just nice to just share what you're doing and you know that yeah i am i'm you know in my studio working today so i you know absolutely share all the things yeah, and I love what Karen said too around like sometimes people don't understand all the work that goes in behind it. So if you can show them, they appreciate more what they're, you know, purchasing or just understanding the process, giving them that behind the scenes look. Um, and what about you, Kate? Do you share on social media as you go or does that keep you motivated or do you just share at the end? Well, so I, um, I, show something every day that I made. And so there are a lot of things that um, sometimes I don't show till later because I don't think they're good or whatever. And I'll put them out there and people like I'll get a really good response. Um, so now I just I post everything kind of that I make um, unless, of course, it's for a project that I can't share yet. Um, but I found it's been really amazing and it's kind of what drives my business. Uh, so I don't know. I have a lot of people reach out to me saying, um, you know, I don't want to share because people might steal it or, um, I'm nervous that it's not good enough. And I just always say, get it out there. Um, if, if you don't share it, it doesn't necessarily exist. So, um, what are the chances that you're going to forget about it and it doesn't exist? So, yeah, I say share everything and um, it's, yeah, it's been great for me. Okay, that's great. Um, there's a couple of really good questions in the chat and I want to make sure we have time for those as well. The first one's from Brandy from Culture on Fire and she says, my personal creative practice always falls off the edge of my task list. 
I even schedule six to 7 a.m. on my calendar, but I sit in my chair, dive into the daily grind. How do you force yourself to put yourself first? And I think that that is so hard to do. So um, I don't know, you could just raise your hand if someone, one of you has a particular, okay, it looks like you have an answer for that one, Danielle. This is so huge with me. I mean, every artist I've ever talked to um, on my podcast or anything, this is always a thing. And one of the best stories I heard about this. Oh yeah. Somebody just said that in the chat. First of all, is six to 7 AM when you're most productive or have you just put that in your schedule? Like personally, I don't get going creatively until about 2 PM and then I could work until 2 AM. So I do all of my admin stuff in the morning and I do all my creative stuff in the afternoon after I've picked my son up from school. Once he's home, he's got a snack, whatever, then I start working. So if six till seven isn't your time, find a new time. Um, also, uh, you just, when you find that time, you have to just see it as your job. Um, there's a professor I interviewed, um, who's also an artist, uh, Mark Bradley Schaup, and he says that he tells his senior students about to graduate that your studio practice has to be just as important as your job at the coffee shop or, or, or if you're still an accountant, but you're doing surface design on the side or whatever, your creative practice has to be just as important as that other stuff. So you would never, um, you know, if you've got studio time booked and somebody calls and says, Hey, we're going for pizza. Do you want to come? You have to say, no, I'm working. Cause you would never blow off your job at a cafe and be like, you know what? I'm just not coming in today. I, I got invited for pizza. You would go and, you know, go to work. So it's the same with your creative time. If you've decided that from four till 5 PM before you have to make dinner is your creative time, you have to lock yourself away. And that is your one hour. Granted, you might not be in the mood right then, but that's when you do stuff like tidy your space, take inventory of your supplies, see what you need to go and buy. Like me, collage artists, just cut stuff out because you know you need to. Um, and that gets your juices flowing for sure. But finding out that time of day where you're actually most creative is the first step. And then you'll be a little bit more dedicated because you'll be ready and in the mood. Great advice. Um, kind of related to that, Jessica wanted to know, she said, I would be interested to know how anyone tries to balance a full-time job or taking care of a family with creating on the side and kind of figuring that piece out. So I don't know if any of you had full-time jobs when you, you know, kind of started your creative business and had to balance that um, or were a caregiver for family members and had to balance that as well. So thoughts on on that one figuring out work-life balance really you want to have thoughts on that one yeah i'll go back to you danielle no problem I, i'm sorry you guys i feel like i'm like and another thing um i'll keep i'll keep it <laughs> short but i was a full-time graphic designer my son was little um i had jealous curator and i was trying to make art and it i felt like a crazy person um and so because i like paper you don't have, I felt like I had to clear the runway. You know, I felt like I needed a 10 hour day where I could just make stuff. And it's like, that was never going to happen. So what I started doing was giving myself 15 minutes to just have my piece of paper and to write down all of my ideas, just write everything down. And if I could make something out of that the next day in my 15 minutes to half an hour window, great. If not, I just kept writing stuff down. Once life kind of calmed down and the, you know, my son got a little bit older, I started, you know, keeping track of my calendar and not saying yes to every single design job that came my way. Um, I could go back into this notebook of gems and there were all these ideas that I'd completely forgotten about. Cause you know, when your life is so crazy, you forget all those wonderful ideas that are flitting in and out. But if you have a practice of writing them down, you can go back and suddenly it's like, who is the genius? that wrote all this stuff and it was you. And you know, and then you've got these places to start that are all your ideas um, once you have some time. So, and again, it's just realizing that your creative practice is part of you. It's important. You make time for it because you want it. It's, it doesn't go below, it shouldn't go below 
all the other things. You know, creativity should be a priority. It, for I know for me, if I haven't made something, I get really grouchy. And my husband's like, maybe you should go make something um, because he knows it'll perk me up. And I'm sure everyone in the chat, I'm sure everyone feels exactly like that. So why on earth wouldn't you make time for it? Even if it's just 15 minutes a day where you get to put your art shoes on and be an artist for 15 minutes, do it. it like Kate said, doing something every day makes a huge difference because then it, you can actually say, I'm an artist. I've done a little bit of something today. Creativity should be a priority is like got to be the, the tagline of this talk. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, go ahead, Kate. Well, I was just going to say, so I, like make something every day, even if it's like with the spaghetti noodles or whatever, even if it's not something you keep, um, it has to be done every day because creativity is a muscle. Everyone has it. Nobody is born with like an, well, we're actually probably all born with a pretty good muscle, but we don't use it very often. And so I have so many people say I'm not creative and they are. And I feel so many days like I'm not creative, but once you sit down and start making, it will come and it doesn't matter what it is, but doing something every day makes your creativity muscle so strong. And you can't, it is really hard to like make something, uh, you know, here and then not again for 30 days. And it's just like, it's not cohesive. Your brain doesn't think well, uh, creativity, creatively, if you don't use it. So, right. I say it for me, it has to be number one and every day. Even I interviewed a scribble on a napkin. I was going to say, I interviewed a quilt artist and she said she took a notebook in her purse in the car. And when she was waiting in car line for school pickup every day, she would just take it out and like sketch what was next out of the car, you know? So at least you got something in that day. So that reminded me of that. Terrence, go ahead. Really quickly. I also think it's really important to communicate with the people in your life that you just need mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20 minutes of creative right. space. So whether it's a brother or sister or a partner who could help with the kids. So I know uh, personally, my mom is battling some health stuff. So I would rely on my sister and my siblings to check in on her just so I could take the time to be creative and they were completely understanding. So just that I had that time and space to cope. So just communicating with the people in your life that you need 20 minutes of creativity can really help. Absolutely. That is so important. I'm so glad you brought that up. Just not because otherwise you feel, you feel resentful and like a martyr and like you're giving up everything that's important to you. And that's never a good feeling and doesn't help. So that's that's great. Janetta, you had your hand up as well around this issue. Um, yeah, and I was just going to elaborate on what creativity could be. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be drawing, it doesn't necessarily have to be painting, cutting collage papers. Um, it could also be taking pictures going for a walk, going on an inspiration shopping trip and being in the store and just looking at and seeing what's out there. Um, looking at the colors of, of the turning of the leaves. It could be anything really. And whatever gets your creative juices going is that that's what you need to fuel and, and, and really tap into that. Um, because yeah, for me, I don't draw every day, but I know that I'm being creative every day in some kind of way, whether I am, you know, observing something that's giving me great ideas, um, or I, you know, I do I do that walk and I, I can think about things that I want to make next and I can write them down, um, or whatever that looks like. But you know, you know, just creative planning or creative um, inspiration. It, you can find it. You can feel it. You can every day in some way, whether you're drawing or not. I love that idea of expanding what the idea of create of creative work is so that it doesn't have to be, you know, maybe what you first thought it, it was so that that's great. And um, we have a question from Jen, which is how do you get out of a creative block? So I don't know if any of you have ever faced this feeling of being just blocked and then been able to pull yourself out. Terrence, your hand is up. <laughs> I just went through this a few weeks ago and I really leaned on my community uh, because I, and I asked them what they do and they gave me a bunch of suggestions. So some of the top ones were getting out of the house, getting out of your studio, 
So I'm a runner, and so I run like three to four, five miles every day. So that really helps clear my mind and my space. Um, I recently took a trip to New York, and I went to the garment district. Um, so, you know, going to your favorite fabric store, going to a new fabric store, maybe one that's outside of your city that'll spark creativity, talking to other creatives, also resting. There is power in rest and taking a nap. I am a huge proponent of a 20 minute nap during the day. Although I set my alarm for 21 minutes because I like that extra one minute to get comfy and cozy in bed. So I get the full 20 minutes. Um, but stepping out of your comfort zone and also taking up a new craft. It doesn't have to be a full time, but if, you know, I'm a sewer, but I also kind of like photography. So just learning, you know, little, little things about photography, just something creative and, and searching for inspiration. Great tips. So, so good. Um, anyone else have a feeling of being blocked ever and any suggestions for pulling yourself out of that to, to add to what Terrence has said? I totally agree that a new craft makes a huge difference. Like I'm all digital, but if I try collage or if I do something else, it makes a huge difference. I totally agree with everything Taryn said though. The nap, um, it clears your brain. But even like, I know some people, you're we're all tight on time, but a quick look at Pinterest. Like I have a Pinterest board that I'm like, this is my inspiration. Like I, it's just my inspiration board. And so I go in there every time I'm like, I don't know what to do, or I'm horrible at art or what, like, what am I thinking? And I just open that up and I'm like, okay, this is what I want to make. Oh, that's a great suggestion as well. Um, and I and think this kind of, oh, go ahead. Let, go sorry, ahead. I was just going to say, and it's not like in my Pinterest board, it's not stuff I do, like it's not fabrics. It's um, paintings or things that are not in my uh, wheelhouse so much, but they inspire me to get better in my wheelhouse. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that for sure. Um, and I think this, this question from Alice, how do you manage family and spouse or spouses that expect you to respond to your phone or texts or questions at all times. So people's expectations that you're constantly available, even the people who are closest to you. And I think this goes back maybe to what you said earlier, Terrence, about communication. Do you have any further thoughts to share on that one about what, what could somebody do who's, you know, phone is alerting all the time and people are like, why aren't you responding to me during, you know, the time when you set aside to be creative? I say just exactly what Taryn said earlier. You just have to communicate. One of the big problems um, I've noticed like in society in general, it's getting a lot better uh, in the last few years, but a lot of people consider creativity really frivolous. And that's why it gets put at the bottom of the list and families who aren't, you know, like living a creative life, they don't understand why you've made this a priority. Like why, you know, you should be doing 12 other things like groceries and dinner and the gym and, spending time with them or whatever that that's all way more important than being creative and so you just have to communicate that no for you it means this and so that half an hour that you're in the studio or that whatever your phone is off sorry like you know back in the day we didn't have a phone strapped to us you know people would have to leave a message on that tiny little tape you know and you would get back to them at the end of the day when you got home and that's you know Sometimes you really, with family, it's tough and you do have to kind of really put your foot down and say, I'm sorry, but this is really important to me and I'm, you're just going to have to wait. And if they can't handle that, I don't, I don't know. You just don't bend, like let them know that this is just as important for you as breathing, you know. That's great. And I think we can end on that note. Oh, sorry. Okay. We have one no, more. Okay. So that's my, okay. Well, I was um, going to say. Yeah. Um, so I got to the point where I had to do it late at night after my kids went to bed. And I know that's like taking away from my sleep or whatever and sleep's important. But for me, it was more important to get a practice in than it was to sleep because I felt better and I'm, I'm an advocate for sleep, but it feels something has to give. And so if you 
need to find a quiet time. Maybe it's after everybody's gone to bed. That's a great point. And good to hear that that was exactly how you got it to work for a while. So during that balance time. So thank you. I just want to say thank you to first to everybody who came and listened and added your questions to the chat. We so appreciate you. And also to the four of you, um, to Terrence and Janetta and to Danielle and Kate, thank you so much for just being here, for sharing your experience, your expertise, um, being real with us about what it's really like to get the work done. So thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us for the Surface Design Symposium. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Bye, everybody.